sort of origin. Um, so the expression of data mind is also informative for trying to inform what's important in the mutation landscape. Yes? Do you think the identity of the virus may change around the way one has to Certainly in that new drivers arise, it's unusual to see a driver go away. Uh, it certainly does happen, especially if there's a large chromosome ablation. Uh, but certainly acquisition of subsequent drivers, especially subsequent subclonal drivers, uh, I think that's going to be the main enemy as we get good at killing off clonal populations. Um, so the, I think once a driver, you're likely always a driver, but certainly additional drivers, uh, we need the ability to find and monitor those over time. And, and not just drivers, but also modifiers to existing drivers. So I actually didn't mention this talk, but EGFR is the most famous there are so sort of three canonical activating mutations in EGFR, and they all get treated with the kinase inhibitor. But there's a very distinct secondary point mutation that increases the affinity of EGFR for ATP instead of the drug. Uh, so that secondary mutation is not really a driver, it's a T7 again. Um, it's not really a driver, but it evades the drug itself. Um, so it's sort of hard to bin everything to passenger and driver, even though I presented it a bit that way. Sort of a 
when the question about the clinical case, so that patient from that choice has made their for a lot, and then that patient still was GFR wild type. Yeah, that's right. There were wild type. Uh, why that was done? Was that before? It wasn't before EGFR. Uh, the EGFR uh, correlation was known, but it wasn't clinically available. So it was sort of in this gray transition period between the discovery at the time there was a debate. Uh, actually, Patsy Janet wrote a great, time, a great paper, um, mutations or fish stories, it's supposed to be amplification or mutation. That was still actually an open question at the time. Uh, so yes, in that case, if we were to do this all again, EGFR mutant negative, maybe we would have considered her lot. Okay, great. Well, I'll be around with the break. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. I'm actually past due to this program, so uh, highly endorse it. <laughs> Hi again, everyone. Um, so I introduced myself, of course, briefly uh, earlier on. My name is Mark Phillips. I work at the Center of Genomics and Policy at McGill University um, in Montreal. Um, as I mentioned, so I have a background in computer science going a ways back, worked as a computer programmer for a while, then went back to school, went to law school, became a lawyer, um, and I look a lot at uh, issues of privacy, data protection, um, uh, some other ethical issues. 
Uh, you may have noticed already that I have not mentioned life sciences anywhere in any of those qualifications. I have no formal training in life sciences, but I've picked up quite a bit up uh, as I've gone along. So I'm going to try to stay somewhat in my lane. I think it seems that this field is like increasingly interdisciplinary with um, the computer science, especially with talking about the ethics stuff. Um, so I'll be talking partly about some of the um, legal ethical issues involved, uh, partly about a bit of uh, background into cloud, uh, cloud computing, et cetera, uh, using virtual machines, starting to move into the more practical um, aspect of this whole workshop. Um, but yeah, that will be the that will be uh, the focus. I'm not going to try to uh, lay out specific rules of exactly what you need to do, uh, because obviously this field is developing and emerging really rapidly. There's a lot of debate and uh, to some degree confusion about what's happening, and so my my goal is going to be to try to raise the different ethical issues, help you to, to be able to uh, notice when there's one kind of in play, be able to discuss more with others when things come up. So that's the idea. Uh, I've listed a few objectives, uh, kind of what I've already probably discussed. So, um, understand the importance of the cloud for genomic research, identify the legal issues, and then we'll talk a bit more specifically about SSH use to interact with virtual machines, which will be kind of the first step of um, some of the work we'll be doing this week. So, I've kind of broken it up into four sections. This first section is um, kind of the cloud portion. So. In the field, we're noticing kind of a huge move into the cloud. Um, this is the first thing is, uh, that comes up as a report from uh, the European Commission. They're planning on building what they're calling the uh, Open Science Cloud. Uh, that's going to kind of link existing uh, infrastructures in Europe to, to allow for medical research in, in Chicago. There's an initiative you might be aware of called the Genomic Data Commons. Um, that's more, more genomic uh, science specific. And a similar project that's the one that we're going to be primarily working with uh, this week um, out of Canada. But it's an international project called the Cancer Genome Collaboratory. Um, and these projects have really been pushed by um, the increasing amounts of genomic data. It's becoming increasingly difficult for uh, researchers to use, to, to analyze, download, share, et cetera, um, work, you know, let alone on their own laptop, even on. Um, University high performance computing centers, um, and there's other there's other reasons as well that delve into some of the, the legal and ethical reasons why um, researchers also would like to have control of their own infrastructures and be able to establish uh, you know the rules and procedures of how they work. So first question, what um, what are we talking about when we're talking about the cloud? Um, just to kind of lay out the baseline. <coughs> The m kind of most common definition you'll see cited is from the U.S. National Institute of Standards and T Technology. What they say is um, that cloud computing <laughs> is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources. I know some examples, network servers, storage applications and services that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. Which is, I mean, so you see a lot of words like ubiquitous, ubiquity, convenience, uh, rapidity, and minimality <coughs> of management, which in my mind are not very concrete. I mean, they're, they're open to interpretation. So to me, this whole definition, I mean, it does say quite a bit, but at first it can be a bit confusing what exactly does this mean, what counts, what, what doesn't. So um, another way people tend to think about it is, and this kind of breaks down some of the elements that you saw in that previous definition, is uh, breaking down what cloud computing means into a few of its essential characteristics. So when we talk about on-demand self-service, we're thinking about not having to interact with a person to set up a new, a new account, a new system. It's convenient that way you can kind of do it yourself. Broad network access, meaning you can access it from a variety of places, not necessarily the entire internet, but it, often it, it is. You can access, uh, access the cloud you know, from your, your phone, from your laptop, et cetera. But it could be within you know, a larger scale, uh, wide area, more private network, et cetera. Uh, when we're talking about resource pooling, uh, what's meant there is it's, it's often kind of um, similar, uh, similar to the idea that these are multi-client uh, services where you might be running a virtual machine that seems to be all your own in the cloud and, and is all your own, but it might be running actually on the same physical system as someone else's software. Um, these services are shared or serving a bunch of different people. Usually that's not a problem. In, in rare cases, there can be uh, difficulty related to that. Um, uh, so rapid elasticity is the next one, so you can easily scale up and scale down what you're doing in terms of both the, the storage you're using for your projects, but also the amount of computing power, the amount of memory, etc., which um, is different from a conventional uh, 
kind of set up. If you're running, say, an academic computing center, when you're not using it, it's kind of sitting there idle. You paid for it. Um, yeah, you're you're having to maintain it anyways. Whereas in the cloud, there's this idea, at least, that you pay only for what you use, um, which is um, related a bit then to the last characteristic I've got here, which is uh, measured surface service. The idea that uh, what people are doing is being measured, not, not only for billing purposes, obviously. Um, for billing purposes, also to try to figure out to, how to optimize the use for quality of service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so these are just kind of some of the, the basic <coughs> notions that people are ta talk about whenever cloud computing gets brought up. It's good to that are good to familiarize or refamiliarize yourself with, so that when they're discussed, uh, it's clear. So people traditionally talk about three different service models that can be provided by. Um, Cloud providers, they kind of range, they're kind of on a continuum. So infrastructure as a service is any kind of uh, cloud provision that's giving you pretty much raw resources, either close to raw storage space or raw compute power or raw memory or some combination thereof. The opposite end of the spectrum is the bottom one software as a service, which be things you're used to maybe viewing through a browser. If you're using viewing your webmail through a browser, you don't have it is still a cloud service. You don't know exactly where uh, your data is being stored how it's being sent to you, but you don't have, you have control only through a very limited portal. Uh, the platform is, as a service, mo uh, service model is somewhere in between where there's some, some tools or pipelines that you have access to, but it's still a kind of a lower level. So what we're going to be working with this week is pretty much the first two layers. So um, infrastructure as a service kind of in the sense that we can fire up virtual machines that we can do pretty much whatever we want with, uh, but we also have some, we can draw on an existing uh, library of analytic pipelines and tools that are platform-like. Uh, you'll also be able to talk about the different deployment models um, as far as the cloud that, that exists. So the first two are public and private cloud, and to some degree those might be uh, or at least I find them counterintuitive as far as what you might think. Public, when we often think of public services, we think of, or at least I think of something being provided by the state. Um, but this is kind of really the opposite of public, public platforms, which are people, things like Amazon, that are made available to anyone, um, whereas private clouds are more made available to it. There are clouds that have been built for specific purposes, specific purpose. Um, another deployment model is uh, the community cloud, which might fit in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, or you could think of, yeah, exactly, that makes sense. Was there, was there another question here, or you know? Um, yeah, so I was, I was thinking that the collaboratory project would fit more in the community cloud, where it's groups of people that have gotten together, but would you say that's more private? But what we're working with here?